Something I've learned while hosting Sports Beat KC presented by Big O Tires is sometimes podcasts fall apart unexpectedly. You know, last minute things happen, but it can also work the other way, like today. Walking into the offices of the Kansas City Star on Tuesday, November 12th, was Phil Snowden. Snowden has lived an amazing life. He represented Clay County in the Missouri General Assembly for 18 years, 10 in the House and 8 in the Senate. He was appointed to the University of Missouri Board of Curators in 2015 and continues to serve in that capacity. Snowden was also Missouri's quarterback from 1957 until 1959, and he led the Tigers to the Orange Bowl as a senior. So Phil Snowden was having coffee with our Vahe Gregorian this morning at a place near the Star, and Vahe invited him to the office. Phil graciously agreed to sit down with Vahe and me, Blair Kirkhoff, to talk about the Tigers. And we started with this story. With the border war back on for Missouri and KU in basketball starting next year, we asked Phil about the time his injured shoulder was treated by none other than Fog Allen. The MU quarterback and the legendary basketball coach got to know each other during these treatments, and Phil shared those stories. Also on today's episode, Kansas basketball made some news with its latest commitment, Bryce Thompson. KU beat writer Jesse Newell stops by to discuss what this and the recent injury to freshman Jalen Wilson means to the Jayhawks. All of this on Sportsbeat KC. We are delighted to be joined by Phil Snowden and Vahe Gregorian, <laughs> but mostly Phil. <laughs> um, and we're going to kind of use the occasion of the renewal of the border war, uh, the Kansas-Missouri uh, rivalry, or the Missouri-Kansas rivalry, if you uh, are so inclined, to, uh, to talk to Phil Snowden about a very interesting time in his in his career uh, at Missouri when he was injured. And I know that's not a great setup for this, but I'm going to let Phil take it from there. Um, Phil, just tell us where you were in school and what the injury was and how it was resolved. And you will learn from this, dear listeners, how this relates to the Kansas-Missouri rivalry. Well, thanks, Blair, for having me uh relay this story. It's one that I've told a number of times. Uh, my sophomore year at university, uh, playing quarterback uh, for uh, Frank Broyles, uh, who was our coach at the time, coached one year. I had a shoulder injury late in the season and uh, couldn't really hardly throw a pass. And uh, Don Ferro, our athletic director and former head coach, uh, approached me and said, uh, would you like to go out to uh, Lawrence, Kansas, and meet with Fog Allen, uh, uh, who, who thinks that he might have an answer for your shoulder injury. And of course, other physicians had looked at it, and nobody could seem to come up with a solution. So I said, yeah, I'll go out and see Fog. And I drove to Lawrence one day and uh, met by him at his office, downtown Lawrence. And uh, uh, he's very uh, personable and uh, immediately said, uh, yeah, I think I know what's wrong with you, and laid me down on his, uh, his, his bench there and uh, felt in my back. And there's a small muscle called the teres minor, and it was almost calcified, and uh, I about jumped through the roof when he touched it. But he treated me with ultrasound and stretching, and uh, immediately it felt better. And uh, over the next two and a half years, I probably was at Lawrence uh, 15 or 20 times meeting with Fogg and hearing stories that he related uh, about his teams and his coaching career and his recruiting and the, and the uh, Olympics and national championships and recruiting of people like Clyde Lavellet and, and uh, Will Chamberlain. And I mean, it was a fascinating story. And uh, I think I told Vi earlier, I'm, I just kicked myself for not having a re, uh, recording device uh, at all these sessions, but it was uh, fascinating stuff. Had to have been. Now, let me, the year is 1957, right? Actually, 1957. Yes. Uh, Fog Allen had been, he, he had ceased to become the Kansas coach a year earlier. Right. The, the yeah. 55, 56 year was his last year as, yeah. the, as the Kansas yeah. coach. And he, he told me uh, that, in his recruitment of Wilt, that he promised Wilt's mother that he would be the head coach for all four years, and that 
then the university pulled the rug out from under him when he reached 70 and he had to retire. And uh, it was a, uh, a big disappointment to, to Fogg and I'm sure it was a big disappointment to the fans as well. Uh, had to have been. Um, and, and I think it was a disappointment to Will Chamberlain too. And uh, uh, I, I met Will a couple of times, but we never talked about that. So I don't know what his side of the story would have been, but uh, I think he was really disappointed that Fogg was not the coach for his four, four years in Kansas. So um, so in 57, the, uh, the, the healing begins on, on the shoulder. And, it, and as you said, it took a couple of years for it to completely yeah. heal, but you continued to play. Yeah. Well, and, and really, it, it wasn't, I mean, it was almost an immediate fix, uh, but I was worried that it was going to come back, and, and so I kept going there, getting a maintenance treatment uh, by Fogg for the next two and a half years through my senior year, and uh, it, it, it worked out, uh, really, I, I, I loved the guy and uh, thought he was a tremendous person. Phil, did it did it strike you at the time as extraordinary to be over in Lawrence as the Missouri quarterback being treated? Uh, and and I, I wonder if uh, the Kansas football coaching staff uh, had some thoughts about that. Well, it it was unusual, and uh, you know a lot of people commented on it, especially at Missouri. And uh, but you know I didn't think anything uh, other than hey, I was getting treated by someone that really knew what they were doing. Uh, it did come out in the media uh, that Jack Mitchell found out that uh, Fogg was treating me and was very upset that, you know, here's the former Kansas coach be treating a Missouri quarterback and who was competing against Kansas. And I think, uh, Blair, in your book about Fogg Allen, you have a chapter about mm-hmm. his uh, osteopathy career, if that's the right way to put it. Um, how how much different is that than anything we know today? Well, it was it was it was incredibly different at the time. He he thought at a very young age and very early in his career that treating injured athletes was going to be fairly important if he wanted to be a will help him contribute to him becoming a successful coach, not just recruiting them and developing them, but treating them and treating their injuries. So. He became the. This happened like he he went to osteopathy school, if I'm pronouncing that right, in like 1910, 1911. He actually stopped coaching Kansas. He was coaching Kansas, Baker, and Haskell for a two or three year stretch. Stopped that to go to basically medical school to learn how to treat athletes. Stayed there for a couple of years, then became football coach, basketball coach, baseball coach at Central Missouri over in Warrensburg before returning to Kansas in 1920. Um, and so he becomes, obviously, what he becomes, right? This, this fantastic coach, the father of basketball coaching. Um, and his, a lot of his success, I shouldn't say a lot, I can't quantify it, but contributing to his success early in his career in the 20s and the 30s was an ability to treat injured athletes and to not have them miss playing time uh, on, on the basketball floor. Um, and I just thought, what a what a forward-thinking idea that was for for someone to you know in in the twenties yeah. to think that way. Yeah, and frankly, uh, Fogg relayed to me several instances where people were injured and how he treated that injury. And I thought at the time uh, he's way ahead of the game, but uh, he pointed out several instances, and it goes along with your story that. He was way ahead of me. Phil, of it. you reminded me of this just now. Had, had had Kansas recruited you, and had you known Fog Allen uh, through any of, of that process? I, obviously, he was coaching basketball, but they had recruited me uh, really to play football, and uh, and I did make a uh, visit to Kansas and uh, liked the school very much. I uh, just uh, lived in Missouri and and had followed the Tigers, and really, that's where I wanted to be. Also, as I learned today, recruited by Army. Yes, I had several offers from other schools, including uh, uh, some of the academies. And, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, 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 Heisman Trophy winner came Doc. to, came to uh, Doc Blanchard. Doc came Blanchard to, came yeah. to, to North Kansas City, flew in on a jet and came to North Kansas City and asked me to 
sign up with Army and be the quarterback there. How about that? Wow. It, it, the Don Faroe's recruiting pitch was the one that, uh, that, that worked out. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was really a good guy and not much of a talker, but he had three points. One, uh, you meet a bunch of people and you can come back and, and open the door for business if you like that. And I thought, that's good. He said, number two, you got two senior quarterbacks next year, but after that we don't have much. And I thought, he said, I think you can play when you're a sophomore. And I thought, yeah, that's good. And then finally, uh, he said, now, I don't know if you like girls or have a girlfriend or not, but he said, we've got university, we've got Stevens uh, campus, we've got Christian campus, and the, the ratio of men to women is about two and a half to one. I'm thinking, that seals it, coach. That's really good. <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> Sold. Well, you, you had a, a series of unbelievable experiences and, and the distinction of, we were talking about this earlier, of playing, playing basketball for Norm Stewart as, on the freshman team, playing football for Don Ferro, Frank Broyles, and Dan Devine, um, and also uh, being treated by, <laughs> by Doc Allen. That, that's quite a legacy. Yeah. I would say that probably there's no one, uh, at least at Missouri, that has that distinction of playing for all those coaches and all of them being Hall of Fame coaches. And they were all terrific people, too. And among your most treasured items, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe I am, is, is the letter you got from Doc Allen uh, near the end of your Missouri career. I, I, I mentioned that to you. Uh, I won, And I've kept it all these years, and it's a handwritten cursive in green ink, and uh, it just tells before the Orange Bowl my senior year, tells us about congratulating me and wishing me well and, uh, and then signing it for T. Fog Allen and uh, at the University of Kansas. So it was, uh, it was, it's really something special to me. So we can't let you go without uh, talking about the Orange Bowl game. What what do you remember about that season? What are some of the the, the, the most striking moments from from a very memorable season for Missouri? Well, I guess a couple of things. One would be the final game of the regular season. Uh, we played Kansas at at KU, and uh, it boiled down to who won that game as to who went to the Orange Bowl, and Missouri won. And it was a tough game and and fairly close. But we won, and then we go to the Orange Bowl, uh, very hot that day. It was in the 90s, uh, I think 71 or 2,000 people in the stands playing a, a really good Georgia team. It was ranked number five in the country. We were ranked like 20th at the time. Uh, we played a good game, but we didn't win, but uh, we did uh, had more yardage rushing and more yardage passing than, than Georgia did. And uh, I always like to say that, uh, you know, they had a pretty good little quarterback at Georgia that year, too, uh, by the name of Fran Tarkenton. And, uh, and I outpassed Fran quite a bit. In fact, I inter intercepted one of his passes, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pretty good game. <laughs> anyway, it was, it, was, it was a tremendous experience. Uh, one thing that was really kind of a downer uh, at the time is we went to a country club afterwards in Coral Gables, and uh, both teams were there, and a lot of fans were there on both sides, and you know it's kind of a, a celebration after after the ball game, and so we're getting off the bus, and uh, all at once uh, this fellow came out and said, uh, Mel West and Norris Stevenson uh, can't go into the party, and uh, you know of course the, the the players we didn't know what was going on, but Divine made the decision that he was going to allow the rest of the team in to the locker room, but that Mel and Norris couldn't go. And I heard him, Devine, make the statement several times following that, that probably the biggest mistake he made in his entire coaching career was not letting Mel West and Norris Stevenson go, go to that party or keeping all right. of the team yeah. out of it. And that, that was just about the time that uh, you, you, you know, the civil rights movement was was heating up and getting more uh, somewhat volatile, but yet it was breaking down a little bit. And uh, uh, anyway, Missouri was uh, Mel and Norris, as both of you probably met over the years, were terrific people. 
and great athletes and represented the university well. It, it was Norris who broke the color barrier. Yeah, it was right? in, in football. And I, but I think it was, it was did Al Abrams? Al back, Abrams was one semester ahead of him. Uh, Norris came my freshman year. He came mid year, and uh, then so he was in spring ball that year, and then Mel came the next year. He was one year behind. Um, Norris said just a little bit more about him. I, I, he became a, a very prominent track coach, and I, I never got to know Mel very well. But Norris was in St. Louis at Florissant Valley, and uh, you, 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 I think, felt close to him over the years. And, and I just thought he was just such a such a gentleman, such a smart guy, rather reserved, uh, but always always a pleasure to be around. Yeah, you couldn't ask for two uh, better examples of people to represent the university and in all phases uh, than, than Norris and Mel West. Uh, Norris from St. Louis and Mel from Jeff City, uh, both tremendous ball players and uh, terrific careers. And then afterwards, both were in education and uh, did very well in their respective fields. One of the reasons, Phil, we got talking to you about this today is sort of we, we, we're we excited here at the Star about the renewal of the, the series with Kansas tonight. I don't I don't imagine that uh, you're anything but excited uh, about seeing this this come back. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, I think it's overdue. Uh, I'm glad to see it happen. Uh, you know, basketball will start this, and I understand their you know athletic directors are talking about a football series, and um, and it will evolve to that, and hopefully we can renew that rivalry. Maybe even come back to Arrowhead like we did, you know, and the and the 2006 seven games those were some of the most spectacular games uh, ever played by Missouri Kansas I think so too but I, I also miss the campus games uh, yeah when, when it when it moved to Arrowhead it, it was I, I've always said in the 30 years I've been at the star that first Kansas Missouri game from an atmosphere standpoint I don't know if I've ever experienced anything like that including Chiefs games yeah it was unbelievable but also uh, and, and in the same thought, those last two Kansas-Missouri basketball games, mm. one at Allen Fieldhouse and the other at, uh, at Mizzou Arena, were just spectacular in terms of atmosphere. And I, 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 I agree with you. I'm, I'm glad that it, in basketball they, they are playing a couple of them at Sprint Center and then campus for the other four. And I hope maybe that becomes the thinking for the football. Maybe one at Arrowhead, but then Columbia and Lawrence – get involved in those two. The, the Kansas-Missouri game was always the final game of the year, wasn't it? The, yes, The, the traditional season-ending game. Yeah, it was. And that had to be something that everybody looked forward to. Yeah. No, and I hope that happens just like you say, maybe some of it at Arrowhead and then some of it on campus. All right. Phil, what, what – and I'm sure we shouldn't keep you much longer, but the only other thought I had in the moment was um, – what did the you had such a unique viewpoint of, of the rivalry over the years, it, both from being in Doc Allen's office to being on the field and, and the many years in between. What what how did you come to sort of see it in your mind as as uh, how important did you see it? How what did you feel like it meant to the Missouri player and the Missouri fan? Yeah. Well, you know, when we stopped playing, uh, it was a disappointment, certainly to me, and I think to many people uh, on both sides of the state line. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know how long it's been since we haven't had the rivalry, but what has it been? Close to S seven years since, now. Yeah, seven years. Since 2012. Uh, uh, but I mean, I'm 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 willing to not look back. I think we've all got to say, hey, we're here, we're back. Let's let's look forward to a great rivalry, uh, and maybe we can renew this to the point where it is really a rivalry between Missouri and Kansas. That's fantastic. Uh, Phil Snowden, we can't thank you enough for, for joining Vahe Gregorian and, and me in this conversation. And I know we uh, it was unexpected, but yeah. you were very gracious to come in and, and speak to us about well, that. Thanks. I enjoyed talking to both of you. 
Big O Tires is rolling out Black Friday deals now through December 8th. Get limited time Black Friday savings on oil changes, brakes, car batteries, and more. You'll also save big on tires. How big? Buy three select tires, get one free with paid installation, including brands like Nitto and Cooper. Get four tires, but pay for only three. Right now at Big O Tires, during Black Friday deals only through December 8th. Interest-free financing available, too. For your nearest participating location, go to BigOtires.com. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners. Unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50, unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Jesse Knowles here. Jesse covers Kansas. Uh, There was some news today, Jesse, on the KU basketball front. Oh, I thought we were going to talk about your birthday. That's news too, right, Blair? <laughs> it's, it's do, you, do you want me to sing? Do you want me and Leah to sing here? It's sad news because once you once you reach a decade milestone, that's you know, especially that decade, that's that's sad. If I looked at a picture of you, Blair, I I figured you'd just reached your fortieth <laughs> decade milestone. So the fact that you're around and add kicking 20. and and add, I was going to say, but add twenty to that, I, I'm very I'm impressed. It, uh, yes, it was big news for Kansas today. Uh, we'll get to that topic. Bryce Thompson. Uh, commits to Kansas, a top 20 guard. And um, speaking of age and maybe Bill Self starting to feel a little bit, part of the reason that he got Bryce Thompson was uh, Bill Self coached his dad at Tulsa. And so now you're starting to be of the age of your Bill Self to say, wow, um, I mean, he'll take it. He'll take the recruiting advantage. But the fact that he was able to coach a uh, a star recruit's dad and have a personal relationship with him that helped him out in this one, uh, that seemed to be a big deal. But you know, obviously the big picture with this, Blair, is that we've talked about how KU could struggle in recruiting with some of the NCAA sanctions hanging over them and potential sanctions coming down the line. And so for a player of Thompson's ilk to choose Kansas, knowing and fully knowing that next year could have ramifications that could impact him, uh, it's a really, really, really significant signing for Kansas. Now, what remains to be seen is whether um, like I said, there's a personal family relationship here. So if something came down the line for Kansas that was really bad, maybe Kansas would let him out of his letter of intent. Maybe the NCAA would do the same sort of thing. So I guess this might not be a final, final decision, but the fact that there was someone out there who uh, had this opportunity to go to Kansas or different really good schools, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and chose Kansas, uh, that's a really, really good pull for Bill Self. And honestly, if it comes to fruition, maybe one of the best ones he's ever had. Who else was uh, was was Thompson considering? Yeah, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State, and uh, actually Mike Boyton, the Oklahoma State coach. That seemed like KU and Oklahoma State were the two finalists, basically for him. If you read the tea leaves, and he tweeted out something really nice today, just to say how he loved Bryce Thompson's family, appreciated to you know getting to know him. They were on him the longest in recruiting, and so that has to sting for the Cowboys to to not get a kid like that. We saw, like for Trey Young, Trey Young goes down to Oklahoma and Kansas. He chose Oklahoma, and for one year, that was a program changer for Oklahoma. You know, you saw how much of a difference that could make. And so if you're Mike Boynton, you could potentially see that with a kid like Bryce Thompson. You say, wow, you can come in here and you can do the same sort of things Trey Young did. But, um, yeah, in the end, it seemed like the family connection. Uh, Bryce just visited last week for a Kansas home basketball game, and the students were showing him some love and chanting for him, all those sorts of things. And um, obviously the connection that he and his family have with Bill Self seemed to be a pretty important part of this and trusting um, him. Him to take care of him and um, he's spoken about how Bill Self sat him down and showed him how he could use him in certain situations with old KU film I know that KU does that with a lot of recruits but seems like he was comfortable with the way he was going to be uh, utilized at Kansas and then also comfortable that on the other end of this he could end up with a pro career like many of these other good KU guards have had so good day good news for for Kansas basketball um, but not all news was good in recent uh, days for the Jayhawks. They got a season-ending injury to to a freshman. That was a, a tough, no pun intended, but a tough break for KU. Yeah, Jalen Wilson um, goes down. It's sort of weird. I, I have it 
the video posted in my Twitter account if people want to go check it out, but like a non-contact sort of injury, he's kind of ran to the corner and then started hobbling and ends up with a broken ankle. And and so, I mean, not to, you know how this works, Blair, with Patrick Mahomes thing. We don't want to play doctors because that's not what we are. And a lot of people online play doctors. Twitter but MD. Exactly. I don't have my Twitter MD yet. I need to go out there and get it uh, online. Maybe University of Phoenix offers it or whatever. But um, it just seemed weird to break your ankle on that play. So maybe there was some stress there. Maybe there was something that was about to give already. And you say season ending. Um, this is a sort of fascinating scenario for Kansas because – um, I think there was at least some thought. You know, Dylan Wilson came in as a top 50 recruit, was kind of considered more of a polished recruit, if you will, not more much of a, a project, a guy kind of ready to help right away. And I think at least in his mind, from some of the quotes he had out there, he had visions of potentially being a one and done and moving on to the NBA. So when you talk about Bill Self said, hey, could medical redshirt, might redshirt, will be out at least, you know, two to three months at best case scenario. Um, this is a sort of fascinating thing because I don't know if it would be season ending if you're Kansas because I don't think you're probably going to have Jalen Wilson around five years, no matter how you slice it. So if you're KU and Egan, you don't want to rush him back. You don't want to make things worse. He just had surgery. And so, I mean, obviously you're going to follow the doctor's instructions and whatever that entails. But if they could get him back by mid-February, um, I know you'd be behind with the playbook. I know you'd be behind a lot of certain aspects and you'd have to get your, um, you know, get your stamina back up, all those sorts of things. But for this Kansas team and for Jalen Wilson's future, I mean, I, I don't know. I almost would pursue that just because I don't think you're going to have him for five years anyway. So there's no use of saying he has to red shirt when um, the potential for him being f- here five years is probably not that high to begin with. So um, that'll be a discussion that obviously the coaching staff and the family has together. And obviously Jalen Wilson faces a, a long road ahead with um, with his recovery. But it's sort of fascinating for KU because now with Mitch Lightfoot out with his red shirt, deciding to red shirt, maybe they'll pull that. Who knows? coming in the future but Isaac McBride left the program um, and then obviously Dewan Harris is a guy that is not acad- academically eligible for this season they're down to nine scholarship players so this is getting a little maybe more dicier than what Bill Self would have wanted at this point in the season but uh, like I said that's something that they're gonna have to deal with now and move forward and uh, you might just see a little bit more of these other guys playing which Bill Self is gonna have to have trust in guys like Christian Brown and Tristan Anarun to kind of step up and take some of that slack. Let's go to the uh, to the games. What kind of progress did and, and can you tell uh, what kind of progress Kansas made from game one to game two? Uh, look, quality of competition was different, but UNC Greensboro wasn't a. I mean, that's that's a team that's going to be competitive in its conference. So uh, nice win for Kansas in game two. Get the get the taste of the of the Duke loss uh, wiped away a little bit. But did, did you see some progress from game one to game two? Yeah, and, and this is a tough time of year, Blair, because KU is sort of in a spot where they don't know who they are yet, and they're trying to figure out who they are and what their best identity is. And so what happened for UNC Greensboro is UNC Greensboro played small, and Kansas really struggled with the two big look again, and then Bill Self basically scrapped it. And for like the last 30 minutes, went to a four-guard look, and um, KU looked pretty good. You know, they, they looked more athletic. They looked better in transition. Um, they space things out better for Yudoka Azubuka. We've talked about how one of the biggest questions for Bill Self this whole season is going to have to be how or who matches up best with Yudoka Azubuki and gets him to his fullest potential. And for, you know, a half or so, Yudoka looked more like himself with a little bit more of a lane cleared out. So there were some good things for Kansas, but yet it's sort of like the good for the four guard is also sort of bad for the two big look, which Kansas, if they're going to be able to play these three guys that are very talented, Yudoka Azubuki, Sylvia De Sosa, and David McCormick, they're gonna have to find a way to get those two guys on the court together, or two of those guys on the court together at the same time. It just hasn't worked out that well so far. So yeah, some positives for Kansas, and I know Bill Self, listening to his post-game comments, he was very happy with how KU played. And uh, sometimes, you know, they can win those sorts of games and Bill Self can be very upset. He was actually very happy with his team after the game and thought that they did a lot of good things. Uh, Now it's just a matter of still kind of getting closer to an identity and figuring out how this too big look is going to um, be good or how they can fit everything in and how you David and Yudoka can play together or Silvio and Yudoka can play together. Or if it just doesn't work, then you slowly transition and you say, okay, um, those guys are going to be bench players, Silvio and, and David, and you move forward with that. But for right now, it's just, it's sort of give and take. It's sort of tinkering and trying these sorts of things so for Kansas they really shouldn't be a finished product right now but I think for a game Bill Self was happy with the result and happy with how his team played and like I said they definitely look like they have a different way that they can play if they want to go to that four guard look. 
All right, Jesse, sounds good. Thanks for dropping by, and we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good, Blair. Links to the stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. KU basketball coverage also can be accessed on the KU Hoops app. Thanks to Leah Becerra for putting together today's show and to Vahe Gregorian for being kind enough to bring Phil Snowden to the office and to the podcast studio. We'll be back on Wednesday for another episode of Sports Beat KC, where we talk sports in Kansas City on a daily basis.